Uh, in our previous class, we discussed Muhammad Iqbal. Then I mentioned that in this class, we would be discussing a contemporary Malaysian writer, Kamal Hassan, Muhammad Kamal Hassan. And I also mentioned that there are some striking similarities between Iqbal and Kamal Hassan. Although Iqbal is widely regarded as a great poet philosopher and Kamal Hassan's recognition has not reached to that level. But when I was doing research on their poetry, I was amazed to notice some uh, striking similarities between their uh, education and between their literary work. Uh, I just want to introduce uh, Muhammad Kamal Hassan, my brothers and sisters, those who are not from Malaysia. Uh, maybe Kamal Hassan is new to you. So Professor Muhammad Kamal Hassan was born in uh, 1942. Uh, and Iqbal died in 1938. So there is a gap of four years between Iqbal and Kamal Hassan. So when uh, I came to Malaysia in 2010 uh, as an academic at International Islamic University, so Kamal Hassan was a kind of surprise for me, a pleasant surprise because uh, at that time I was just a newcomer at the university, but I attended many of his lectures and many of his discussions where he talks about uh, our education system, uh, the challenges of modern education, the westernization and secularization of modern education and how to address uh, these issues. So if we look at him as a person, we will find him as an embodiment of the concept of integration of knowledge. When we say that knowledge is one composite whole, when we say that uh, we have the unity of knowledge, there shouldn't be any compartmentalization in knowledge. What we mean is that knowledge is a composite whole and a person should be enriched with knowledge of all sorts. Uh, I mean, knowledge of both this world and the next world, knowledge of dunya and akhira, knowledge of Eastern sciences and Western sciences. So in that respect, Kamal Hassan is an embodiment of the concept of integration of knowledge because he has been exposed to modern sciences and traditional sciences. He has been exposed to Western education and Eastern education. And uh, he is a polyglot scholar in the sense that he knows a number of languages. And when I first came to IIUM, I was amazed to attend his lectures. And when I saw that a professor of Usuluddin was speaking English as if he's a native speaker, that was a pleasant surprise for me. So this is Professor Kamal Hassan. And when I did some research on his life and on the life of Muhammad Iqbal, I found that Muhammad Iqbal had his mentor, mentor that was Thomas Arnold. In the same way, Kamal Hassan also had one had a mentor who facilitated, who encouraged, who inspired him for higher education. That is Ismail Nawab. Ismail Nawab was a professor at the University of Malaya when Kamal Hassan was a student there, an undergraduate student. And Ismail Nawab had huge influence on Kamal Hassan. 
By the way, Ismail Nawab is the father of a very famous Anglophone poet, a famous Saudi Arabian Anglophone poet. Her name is Niyama Ismail Nawab. So Ismail Nawab was the father of Niyama Ismail Nawab. So both Ismail Nawab and Thomas Arnold taught in the East and the West. Ismail Nawab taught at the University of Edinburgh, and then he taught in Malaysia. Thomas Arnold taught in British India, and then he taught at the University of London. So these are just some similarities between Kamal Hassan and Muhammad Iqbal. And Muhammad Iqbal taught at the University of London as a professor of Arabic literature. Uh, when he was replacing Thomas Arnold. Thomas Arnold was on leave for six months and uh, Muhammad Iqbal replaced him as a professor of Arabic literature. And Kamal Hassan also taught at Georgetown University in Washington from 1997 to 1999. He was a visiting professor at the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. So these are some similarities. And Kamal Hassan uh, is a polyglot, polyglot scholar. Polyglot scholar means a scholar who knows a number of languages. Uh, I can share with you this term. Uh, a polyglot scholar, a scholar who knows a number of languages. Kamal Hassan is uh, such a scholar. Uh, he, uh, no, he learned Arabic, Persian, French, Germany, and then Bahasa Indonesia, in addition to his mother tongue, Bahasa Malaysia. So these are the languages he learned. He learned Arabic and Persian as a requirement uh, of his doctoral program at the university at the at Columbia University in New York, and he also he also had to learn French and German when he was a student, a PhD student at Columbia University. Uh, so even though he he knows Arabic, Persian, French, German, but his main language of academic communication is English. This is his main language. Now, <clears throat> uh, even though I will discuss Kamal Hassan's poetry today, but I just want to share with you uh, his uh, concept of education. Uh, his educational ideas, uh, because this is what he is uh, always uh, concerned with in his writings, in his speeches. He always talks about education, the, re uh, the reforming of education in Muslim, especially in Muslim societies. So Kamal Hassan actually promotes the concept of the reintegration of knowledge. Generally, we talk about integration of knowledge, but Kamal Hassan says it is reintegration because for about one millennium, for about 10 centuries, all around Muslim world, around the Muslim world, education was integrated. Then because of European colonialism, education was compartmentalized, education was bifurcated, separated one from the other, from religious education from so-called secular education. That was a kind of interruption that happened because of colonial rule. But before European colonialism, education in the Muslim world was always integrated. That's why he prefers to use the term reintegration of knowledge, not simply integration. And in his speeches, in his writings, uh, Kamal Hassan often refers to Muhammad Iqbal 
and the other day he was uh, i was talking to him and he uh, mentioned this particular quote from muhammad iqbal which i want to share with you uh, this is what iqbal says about uh, education uh, in the muslim world iqbal says Abu Lahab should be metamorphosed into Haider. If this Abu Lahab becomes Haider Iqarar, or in other words, if it, knowledge and the power it wields, becomes subservient to Deen, then it would be an unmixed blessing unto mankind. So, Iqbal uses this metaphor of Abu Lahab or Bu Lahab and or Haider Iqarar or Ali in many of his writings. And so what he says is that the uh, conventional or colonial education system that is dominant in Muslim societies only produces Abu Lahab. They do not produce Haider Iqarar or Ali radiallahu ta'ala if we can change Abu Lahab to Haider Iqarar, or in other words, if uh, our knowledge is subservient to our religion, then it would be an unmixed blessing. This is what Iqbal says, and Kamal Hassan refers to Iqbal quite often in his speeches. Um, uh, in, uh, in Kamal Hassan's speeches and in his writings, he also refers to a contemporary Western scholar quite often. And I believe we also know about this man and his book. Uh, the, his name is um, Harry Lewis. Harry Lewis was a professor at uh, Harvard University. He is still alive. And in 2006, he wrote a book. The title of the book is Excellence Without a Soul, How a Great University Forgot Education. So Harry Lewis taught at Harvard University for about 30 years. After teaching at 30 years, he was disappointed. He was disillusioned. So he thought what Harvard was offering to its students was not actually education. It was simply a set of facts and figures that students were receiving from university. So that's why he said, excellence without a soul. Harvard University and many other universities like Harvard may be excellent in providing so-called education, but there is no soul. There is no humanity there is no spirit in that education. Then he said how a great university forgot education, that what Harvard provides is not actually education. Harvard has forgotten about true education. The same book was uh, published in 2007 with a diff different subtitle. Uh, the, the new sub uh, subtitle is the new title is Excellence Without a Soul, Does Liberal Education Has a Future? So this is uh, uh, what uh, 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 Harry Lewis wrote and Kamal Hassan actually popularized this book among us at IIUM, uh, International Islamic University in Malaysia. Why does he refer to this book quite often? Because he believes that this educational crisis is not only a matter of the East or the West. It is both the East and the West that are suffering from this crisis in education. It's not only the East or the West. Another reason why he refers to this book quite often is that there are Attend, there is a tendency among us, especially among the educated elite in Muslim societies, to imitate, to replicate Western education system in our country. And Kamal Hassan, by referring to this book, he gives a warning to those who want to imitate Western education, especially the educated elites and the bureaucrats, 
that imitating or replicating Western education may not be good for Muslim societies. And uh, I want to share with you a few quotes from the book, uh, uh, Harry Lewis's book. Uh, it's an interesting book. If you have time, I believe uh, all of you should read the book. Uh, I just want to share some quotes from the book. Uh, one is, uh, Harry Lewis says, the relationship of the students to the colleges, to college is increasingly that of a customer to a vendor of expensive, expensive goods and services. The title of the book I mentioned, Excellence Without a Soul, How a Great University Forgot Education. Excellence Without a Soul, How a Great University for good education. Another quote from the book is, this is quite alarming, but this is true. He says in page 108, society is going to hell in a hand basket and the great universities are going to get there first. That means our society is degenerated, our society is corrupt, and the universities are ahead of us in terms of degeneration, in, ter in terms of corruption. So these are some warnings that we receive from Harry Lewis's book and Kamal Hassan uh, quotes from this, I mean, refers to this book quite often. Now, uh, I will spend a few more years and then I will move on to his poem. In Kamal Hassan's speeches and in his writing, he talks about Al-Muhlikat. He refers to Imam Al-Ghazali and he uses Al-Ghazali's term uh, to discuss corruption in education or the uh, wrong attributes of our educated scholars. He uses uh, the term from Al-Ghazali, Al-Muhlikat. Al-Muhlikat means destructive elements. Destructive elements. So what are the destructive elements uh, among scholars, among contemporary scholars, scholars who are associated, affiliated with universities? One is self-centeredness. They are self-centered. They simply want to serve their own purpose, self-serving. Another problem is they have an inflated sense of self-importance. They are egotistical. They believe they're very important. They want praise and recognition from others. They are boastful. They like to glorify themselves. So all these are al-muhlikat. And, and other muhlikat, other destructive elements are flattery. Scholars like flattery, adulation. They like excessive praise. And they make this the end of their uh, scholarship. And it is very common when we see that among our PhD graduate, right after receiving their degree, they want to use it as a status marker. They want to use their PhD as a status marker that I am now superior to other people. All people have to call me a doctor, even though the quality of our PhDs are very much questionable in terms of their competence. But these are muhlika, these are diseases of the heart. Uh, and Kamal Hassan is very much concerned about uh, these al-muhlikat, which he obviously has noticed, and he critiques these uh, muhlikat, the diseases of the heart. Uh, and Kamal Hassan uh, was actually uh, with, the, with IIUM right from the beginning. Uh, he was deeply involved at, with the, uh, in the establishment of International Islamic University Malaysia, and he is the one who wrote its concept paper. 
and he refers to uh, a contemporary, uh, uh, not contemporary, a, a Malaysian scholar. He, his name is uh, Zaba. And Zaba promoted the concept of uh, education. Um, it's called uh, Dua Dalam Satu. Dua Dalam Satu. Uh, let me share this with you. This is Zaba's term. He says, uh, Tana Malaysia, that means uh, the land of Tana Malay or the land of Malay, that means the Malay world needs an education system that is Dua Dalam Satu, two in one. An education that is two in one. A university that provides both education religious and non-religious. So this was the idea behind establishing International Islamic University of Malaysia. And Kamal, as opposed to uh, westernized, secularized scholar, uh, Kamal Hassan promotes the concept of Ulul Albab. Ulul Albab. He says we need to produce scholars who will be and obviously, uh, this term appears in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, verse 191 When Allah says, La ayatilil ulil albab, Aladina the Gurun of La Hakiyama of Kuda Wala Junubihim, where the Fakuna Fihalpi Samawati will art, Rabbana Mahalakta the Batil. So this is Ulul Albab. So Kamal Hassan believes that we need to produce Ulul Albab, and this is what he mentions in his article. He says we need to produce intellectuals and scholars par excellence who combine the understanding of the book of nature with the book of revelation and integrate human reason with divine revelation. So we need scholars who will learn, who will know the book of nature and the book of revelation. The book of nature means the worldly knowledge or knowledge of science and our surrounding atmosphere, our society and book of revelation that is the quran so there must be an integration of these two branches of knowledge and uh, this has been the case in islamic history as i said earlier before european colonial incursion the muslim world was always an uh, uh, muslim world always had an integrated education system there is no difference between religious sciences and non-religious sciences. All subjects were taught at masjid. Most universities in the Muslim world, early universities in the Muslim world began in masjid. For example, the University of Karabin, the earliest uh, continuing university in Morocco, that began its journey from a masjid. A university of Al-Azhar University in Egypt, that also began its journey from Masjid. So in the Islamic world, education was always integrated or part of uh, the religious establishment. El education was never separated from religion. So this is roughly about Kamal Hassan's educational philosophy. Now I am moving uh, to his poem. Uh, the poem that I want to discuss with you. And there are striking similarities between Kamal Hassan's poem and uh, Muhammad Iqbal's poem. Uh, these are the two poems that I compared uh, in an article uh, uh, that was published early this year, uh, Iqbal's and Hassan's Complaints, the title of the article. Uh, these are the two poems. The, in the last class, we discussed uh, Iqbal's poem, and today we'll discuss uh, Kamal Hassan's poem. Iqbal's poem is to the Holy Prophet. 
and Kamal Kamal Hassan's poem is SMS to Sir Mohammed has another title. The other complaining to Iqbal. So there is a kind of triangular hierarchy in these two poems. Muhammad Iqbal complains to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and Kamal Hassan complains to Muhammad Iqbal. So both of them complain about contemporary Muslim society and they uh, obviously they feel sad uh, after seeing all the moral chaos and political and economic subjugation of Muslim society. Both of them notice a kind of moral paralysis in Muslim society. So I, I have interpreted both uh, Malik Ben Nabi's ideas. Malik Ben Nabi, the Algerian scholar, the great Algerian scholar, has a, has a concept, has a theory. It's the concept of, of colonizability. In Arabic, it says, Al Qabiliya lil istiamar. Al Qabiliya lil istiamar. What Malik Ben Nabi says is that Muslim societies or many colonized societies were colonizable. They were ready to receive Western colonialism, they were ready to receive uh, Western intervention in their countries. But it means the Muslim societies before European colonialism was so weak morally and politically, but so weak that even if the Europeans did not colonize them, any other power could come and occupy their countries. So this is what Malik Ben Nabi argues that Muslim societies were colonizable. They were ready to receive colonial intervention. Uh, in Arabic, as I said, it is al qabiliya colonizable. So both Kamal Hassan and Muhammad Iqbal, they portrays Muslim societies in such a way that they were ready for colonial rule. So Muhammad Iqbal was talking about the 1930s when Muslim, all, most Muslim countries were under European colonialism, the condition of Algeria and Libya and South Asian subcontinent, all these Muslim uh, regions were under European rules. So in Kamal Hassan's poem, SMS to Sir Muhammad Iqbal, he talks about the 2000s. I mean, after 9-11, we have a new world order. We have a, a new uh, a system of colonialism. We have a new system of oppression uh, to which Muslims have been subjugated, have been subjected. So these are the two poems talking about two different times, 1930s and 2000s. And interestingly, in both uh, times, Muslims uh, have, re have remained uh, I mean, totally subjugated, humiliated, exploited by the West. Uh, in Iqbal's poem, even though Iqbal uh, regrets the plight of Muslims, in, in one place in his poem, Iqbal regards the Muslims as the cream of the whole world as the cream of the whole world. Uh, we must uh, remember this term. Iqbal regards the Muslims as the cream of the whole world. But he says Muslims have remained forgot, uh, forgetful about their status. They are the cream of the whole world, but they are forgetful of their status. Similarly, Kamal Hassan refers to a Quranic verse, and he also says that Muslims are the best. 
And he uses this Quranic phrase, Khairu Ummatin. Muslims are the best of community, the best community, the Khairu Ummatin. So Iqbal does not refer to the Quranic uh, verse, but perhaps uh, he was uh, indirectly alluding to the same Quranic uh, verse when he said that the Muslims were the cream of the whole world. And Kamal Hassan says Muslims are Khairu Ummatin, the best community. But both Muhammad Iqbal and Kamal Hassan, they regret the fact that, that this cream of the whole world and these Khairu Ummatin are forgetful of themselves. And they are in love with uh, Western culture. They are in love with uh, Western uh, uh, products. And another very interesting similarity between Kamal Hassan's, between Iqbal's poem and Kamal Hassan's poem is that both of them end their poems with a note of hope. Both of them and their poem with a note of hope. Uh, let me share with you the last section of both the poems. Uh, even though they are uh, complaining about the plight of the Muslim world in their poem, but uh, according to the Quran, we are not supposed to despair. So they also maintain that hopefulness and they ended their poem with a note of hope. So Muhammad Kamal Hassan says towards the end of his poem, yes, O oh Iqbal, the sun will rise in the west as Musa salam, rose in the palace of Firaun. So a note of hope, uh, optimism. And he says, no, inshallah, Islam will be triumphant again. And Muhammad Iqbal also concluded his poem with a note of hope. He said, I am like a half burnt piece of wood in the desert. The caravan has passed on and I am still burning. In this vast wall, perhaps another caravan one day may appear. So Iqbal says, no problem. Maybe this generation is westernized, secularized, mesmerized by Western culture and Western products. But hopefully there will be another generation that will remain true to their identity, that will remain uh, uh, true, um, uh, uh, I mean, true Muslims. And we have these two verses in the Quran. I mentioned these two verses. If you can uh, have a look at these two verses. In these two verses, Allah says, uh, that if you do not, if you are not up to mark, or you who believe, if you are not up to mark, Allah will replace you with another community. There will be another group of people who will not be like you. They will be better than you. So both Kamal Hassan and Muhammad Iqbal, they end their poems with a note of hope. Uh, another interesting similarity is that uh, both Kamal, uh, Iqbal and Kamal Hassan visited Spain and they were highly inspired by their visit to Spain. Iqbal visited Spain in 1933. He was actually in London to attend uh, the Roundtable Conference. From there, he traveled to other European countries and he went to uh, uh, Spain uh, in 1933 and he prayed in Masjid al Cordoba. And Iqbal was the first Muslim. I think we should know this information from, nine, uh, from 1492 until 1933. The Spanish government did not allow any Muslim to pray in Masjid Qartuba. Iqbal was the first Muslim to worship, to pray in the mosque of Cordoba since his, his conversion into a cathedral after the Moors were expelled from Spain in, 19, uh, in 1492. 
so roughly after 600 years, Iqbal was the first Muslim to pray in Masjid al Cordoba or the, mos uh, the mo mosque of Cordoba. Because of Iqbal's status as a world intellectual, as a world-class writer, perhaps the Spanish government made that exception. And even until now, the Spanish government, they do not allow any Muslims to pray inside Masjid Qurtuba because they have already transformed it into a uh, cathedral. Now, not only Iqbal and Kamal Hassan, there are many, many Muslim writers who are inspired by their visit to Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain. Uh, we have the Egyptian writer, uh, Ahmad Shawki. Ahmad Shawki was sent by the British during World War I. And he was in Spain and he wrote a number of poems while he was in Spain, Ahmad Shawki. And then again, uh, a great Pakistani poet, Altaf Hussein Hali, he, was, he also wrote poems uh, after visiting Muslim Spain. And one interesting thing is that whenever a Muslim visits uh, Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain, they have a mixture of pride and regret. A, mi a mixture of pride and regret. We feel proud thinking of what our ancestors did in Spain, how they were at the forefront of technological and scientific advancement during that time. At the same time, that also gives us a sense of regret. So this is the quote from the Palestinian literary scholar, Salma Khadra Jayushi. She says, it is said that no Arab or Muslim has ever visited Al-Andalus and viewed its great Islamic monuments without experiencing a mixture of pride and regret. So this is a common experience of Muslims who visit Al-Andalus, we have an exp a mixed experience of pride and regret. So similarly, obviously, Iqbal and Kamal Hassan, they also had the same experience. And Kamal Hassan refers to Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain quite often in his poem that we are going to read very soon, inshallah. Now, <clears throat> uh, let us... Uh, begin reading the poem. I will try to share with you this poem. We will read it together. I don't know how much, how far we can go. Uh, uh, later, I will share with you this poem with, through Brother Shaharan, inshallah. So we are reading this poem by Kamal Hassan. Uh, this is another version of the poem, complaining to Iqbal. Uh, but Kamal Hassan prefers the other title. SMS to Sir Muhammad Iqbal. So Kamal Hassan says, O oh Iqbal, the spring of 2002 beckoned my soul and body to witness the Muslim remains of Alhambra, Cordoba, and Sevilla. So he refers to three Muslim, uh, I mean, three Spanish cities which are full of Muslim architectural and uh, architectonic glory, uh, Granada, where Alhambra is located and Cordoba and Sevilla. To retrace your noble steps, because Iqbal also visited Alhambra, Iqbal also visited Cordoba. So that's why he says to retrace your noble steps and feel the vibration of your ecstasy. To feast my aging vision on the haunting grandeur of Alhambra. To feast my aging vision. He says my aging vision because when Muhammad Kamal Hassan visited Spain, he was 60 years old. He visited in 2002 and he was born in 1942. So he says my aging vision on the haunting grandeur of Alhambra and relish the matchless beauty of Moorish art, Muslim art. 
I glided through the cold ruins, searching for the secrets of the humiliating downfall of Al Andalus. So, a sense of regret. So, Kamal Hassan obviously has a sense of regret because he is referring to the humiliating downfall of Al Andalus, the way Muslims were expelled uh, finally in 1492 from Spain. It was full of humiliation. The flowing fountains of Jannatul Arif, that is a garden uh, that Muslims, uh, uh, I mean, uh, established in Spain, continue to narrate the melancholy of Muslim follies. So Kamal Hassan is trying to understand the reason why Muslim fell in Spain why they ended up in such a humiliating uh, uh, a tragedy. How they succumbed to the same diseases which brought down the mighty Roman Empire. This is uh, important for us to understand. Generally, we say that 1492 was the downfall of Muslim Spain, but that is actually not true. The actual downfall started long ago. That started in the 11th century. So for Muslim Spain to fall, it took 300 years. The actual downfall, the actual problems that led to the downfall started long ago. So Kamal Hassan is trying to understand what were the reasons, what were the diseases that brought them down. They brought them to their knees. And he narrates one after another. He describes one after another why Muslims in Spain lost power uh, to the uh, Christians, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. They wrote all over Al Andalus, La Ghaliba illallah. Muslims, they wrote on the walls in Andalus that La Ghaliba illallah, there is no vanquisher except Allah. That means they glorified Allah, they mentioned Allah's names here and there, but they began to worship Mata Dunya. But in reality, in their actual life, they worshipped Mata Dunya, the pleasures of the world. And Kamal Hassan not only in, the, in this poem, in his speeches, in his other writings, he talks about this Mata dunya quite often. That we Muslims, especially Muslim scholars, are after dunya. We want the pleasure of the world. So these were the main reasons, some of the main reasons why uh, Muslims uh, ended up in a tragedy in Spain. They, wrote La Ghaliba illallah, but in their actual life, they followed a kind of hedonistic culture, a kind of uh, a life of comfort and luxury. And traded their souls for gold, glory, women, and wine. So these were the real reasons why Spain fell. Muslim Spain fell. And this is almost the same concept that Muhammad Iqbal said in his poem. Uh, he talks about the educated Muslim. This hungry man has bread. Iqbal said in his poem, which we studied in the previous class, this hungry man has bartered away his soul for a piece of bread for just a little bit of material benefit, Muslim, educated Muslim, they are ready to sell their soul. And Kamal Hassan says the same thing, using a different language. He says, Muslims traded their souls for gold, glory, women, and wine. In other words, they were busy enjoying their life without any moral or religious consideration only to end like stray donkeys. They, they eventually, their lifestyle, their hedonistic lifestyle, 
their pursuit of comfort made them humiliated. They were they were like stray donkeys. And um, Muhammad Iqbal uses a similar metaphor to uh, describe the humiliation that Muslims face uh, in his time. Uh, he uses the uh, um, I can't, um, sorry, uh, Iqbal says, uh, I uh, should uh, share this with you. This is an interesting similarity between Iqbal and Kamal Hassan. Uh, I am a bit lost. I... Okay, anyway, so I, uh, I could not get what uh, Iqbal says. Iqbal says that uh, he picks up grain from the ground like domestic birds and is unaware of the blue expanse of space. That Muslims were so humiliated that they were like chickens. They were ready to pick up food from dirt like domestic birds. And Kamal Hassan says the same thing, that they were like stray donkeys, kicked around by the boars of Ferdinand and Isabella, by the uh, soldiers, by the uh, armies of Ferdinand and Isabella, they were simply kicked by the boots. Today, pigeons national and make love in the ruins, in the ruins of Muslim architects and Muslim monuments in Spain. Their droppings is strewn all over the walls. Western tourists pour out of buses and planes, frolicking in Romans, obliterating all pain while Muslim architectural glory continues to boast the coffers of Catholic Spain. So the same thing is in India, in today's India. All the important monuments in today's India were built by Muslims. And uh, Taj Mahal, Jama Masjid, the Red Fort, and so many other big, big monuments uh, through which the Indian government is earning lots of foreign currency. The same thing in Spain. Like the people uh, go there to see Alhambra, Cordoba, Sevilla, and Janatul Arif, and this and that. Eventually, the Catholic Spain, the country Spain, they uh, benefit economically. Okay, so this is. Uh, Kamal Hassan, he, he is talking about the fall of Spain, but he does not put the entire blame on the Christians for the fall of Muslim Spain. He blames Muslims themselves. It is because of their lifestyle. It is because of their uh, uh, hedonistic impulse, their love for comfort and luxury. That was uh, that they ended up in humiliation expulsion in uh, Spain. So I will share with you this, uh, it's a beautiful poem, uh, full of interesting ideas and full of interesting images. Uh, I believe it is uh, worth reading. Uh, so I will share this poem with you. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, you will read it. So what I want to say finally is that like, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, Kamal Hassan also does not end his responsibility by blaming non-Muslims for the suffering of Muslims. Both Muhammad Iqbal and Kamal Hassan wants Muslims to introspect, to look at themselves. What went wrong in our lifestyle? What went wrong in our everyday life? That we are being humiliated and we are being oppressed and marginalized all around the world. And again, I refer to Malik Ben-Nabi's notion of uh, colonizability. 
القابلية للاستعمار that Muslim societies are basically ready for colonialism. The way they live their life, the way they are dependent on others, even for food, for everything, for knowledge, for scholarship, for everything. We are depend, uh, we rely on, on the West. And that is the main reason why we Muslims uh, are suffering. And our suffering will not end unless and until we change our lifestyle. But we need to be on top, uh, at the top of others through knowledge and scholarship, through our lifestyle, which is based on our religious teachings, not based on uh, westernization or uh, senseless imitation of Western culture. So with this, I conclude, uh, I'll be very happy to entertain your queries or questions, and I will also invite you to share with us your ideas. Assalamu alaikum wa Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. <coughs> A very well presentation indeed of Prof. Kamal Hassan. As we said, he is the embodiment of knowledge. I really like that word because okay. his humility, uh, his uh, concern for the Ummah and his willingness to listen also. Yes. Well, Alhamdulillah, we are so proud to have uh, such a, a towering uh, figure like him, inshallah. So, and so I learned new few, few things from you also about him, <laughs> about this guru and things, yeah, inshallah. So we open to all friends. Any uh, question or you want to ask more, inshallah. We, we may be able to get him in one of our, of our intellectual discourse, inshallah, uh, soon. So far, we don't have anything. Uh, maybe a bit diversion, uh, bro. What is his term of this Islamization that he is promoting? Uh, uh, Can you explain uh, a bit? Yeah. Generally, at our university, we use the term Islamization of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kamal Hassan prefers uh, the term um, Islamization of knowledge. Uh, let me write it down. Uh, Islamization of knowledge. So instead of Islamization of knowledge, he prefers Islamization of knowledge. The reason is when we say Islamization of knowledge, there is a sense of conversion, as if we are converting knowledge to Islam. And when a Western scholar first hears the term Islamization of knowledge, they feel scared, as if we are imposing Islam on knowledge. Although we do not mean it, but many people have this notion that by Islamizing knowledge, we are forcing Islam on knowledge. So that's why Kamal Hassan say, he says, if we say Islamization, that sense of conversion is not there. Another reason is when we say Islamization of knowledge, we mean we are trying to make knowledge Islamic. We are not making knowledge Islam or Islamized. We are simply making knowledge Islamic in compliance with Islam. Uh, he mentions three reasons. I mentioned Two, there is another reason uh, which I forgot, the term Islamization of knowledge. I don't worry about the term. The concept is more important to me. I believe this concept is as old as Islam because during our prophet's time, uh, there were uh, Abu Lahab and Haidari Qarar or uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So these two streams of knowledge, I mean, secular, atheistic, uh, uh, Un-Islamic knowledge and Islamic knowledge. These two branches, these two streams existed uh, since the beginning of Islam. And our uh, uh, our struggle, our movement is to change Abu Lahab to Haidari Qarar. So the movement, the concept is important. 
I don't worry too much about terminology. Yeah. Okay, Prof. It. Uh, I have the personal experience with it. I have a friend been talking for years. Then I discovered he he thought Islamization is converting people. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he understood what Islamization is. <laughs> and then I discovered for him, Islamization is just conversion. Uh, so, I mean, the, <laughs> Prof Kamal is right to make that word is more neutral. Yeah, not, not yes. a conversion. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Otherwise, we will ask Prof Mahmoud to conclude. If no, yeah. Okay, Prof. Uh, fi final words for tonight, inshallah. Before we close. Uh, so I think uh, our next class will be the last class in yeah, this the last another one, contemporary yeah. writer. Yeah, and yeah. this time we will discuss a female writer. Uh, yeah. yeah, the Shalina Jan Muhammad. Uh, we will discuss uh, her memoir, her autobiography, Love in a Hair Scarf. It's a wonderful book, wonderful memoir. Uh, I hope uh, we will uh, enjoy the class, inshallah, next class. Love okay. in a Hair Scarf by Shalina Jan Muhammad. Shalina Jan Muhammad. Okay, Prof. Okay, everyone. See everyone next week, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.